All right, I think we can uh, go ahead and get started. Um, thanks so much to everyone for uh, joining us on the Concrete Sustainability Hub's uh, public webinar. I'm Jeremy Gregory, and I'm the Executive Director of the Concrete Sustainability Hub at MIT. And uh, people who have joined us in the past know that we often share our own research in the Concrete Sustainability Hub. Um, but this month, we have a little bit different opportunity where we're uh, talking about a topic that's certainly been important to us at the Hub, but we have uh, some other experts to share um, their expertise on this topic, and the, the topic is um, performance-based specifications for concrete. Um, this topic came up recently actually at a, a conference that we uh, hosted here at MIT uh, uh, about a month or so ago along with the Boston Society of Architects on embodied carbon in buildings. And we talked about a lot of solutions to lower the environmental footprint of concrete. Uh, and there are a lot of technological solutions that are currently available. But one of the most critical ones that we talked about was, and, and it's actually in some ways rather simple, and I think as you'll hear today also can be more complicated, is the use of performance-based specifications. Um, so what we did is we asked uh, two experts on performance-based specifications from the National Ready Mix Concrete Association, uh, Colin Lobo and Kartik Obla, to share with us some of the work that they've been doing on performance-based specifications for the past uh, two decades, um, and uh, to, to talk about that, uh, the work that they've done, uh, and then hopefully use that as a springboard to start a conversation about this. Um, just a few uh, uh, housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, because we have a large number of attendees, everyone is uh, muted, um, but we do have an opportunity for questions. Um, in the lower right of the screen, <clears throat> um, you'll see a, a Q&A box, and if you just click on that, you can ask a question, and we've already had one come in about whether the slides will be made available after the presentation. Um, the rec we are recording this, and that will be posted to YouTube, so you can share the whole presentation with others uh, who are interested, and you can also um, contact us um, at cshub at mit.edu to get the slides, and um, we'll add a reminder to that at the end. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Colin and Kartik. Colin is going to start us out, and then he'll hand it over to uh, Kartik. So Colin, please uh, take it away. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, Andrew, also for facilitating this discussion. Uh, my name is Colin Lobo. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Engineering Division at the National Ready Mix Concrete Association. Uh, and, and our primary discussion is going to be on uh, the use of performance-based specifications. But to start the discussion here is the broader question is what is the environmental impact of concrete construction? And there's been some negative and, and considerable discussion about the impact of concrete uh, on, on uh, global warming and, and those sorts of things. You, you might be aware of the Guardian's, uh, the set of articles in the Guardian uh, publication and other uh, discussions related to that. Uh, we are going to just focus on the specification angle. We do have a considerable uh, level of expertise uh, from other members of NRMC on the sustainability side also. Uh, so when we look at uh, the general focus of sustainability, the impression is that it can vary depending on who's looking at it. One can look at the design aspect and see whether the designer is designing the structure to be structurally efficient in the sense that they are minimizing the quantity of materials that are used in constructing of a building. One could look at it from the constructible angle and see whether uh, the process of construction, whether it is very complicated from the architectural perspective that requires considerably more extensive formwork or reinforcement, detailing, etc. One could look at it from the service life angle, from the owner's perspective, and see whether the structure will be durable for its intended service life. And we have a wide range of exposure conditions that concrete is exposed to, and they have to be specified accordingly to meet the durability requirements for that exposure. And, and lastly, we could look at it from the resilience standpoint and the impact on society uh, from a catastrophic event and the re, uh, rebound of that society uh, after that event and how does concrete play in that system. When we look at specifications and sustainability, we have to sort of recognize a synergy between performance-based specifications 
and the opportunities that it might present for sustainability. And we might look at the minimizing of the environmental impact of the construction process or the materials used in a building, conserving available resources, minimizing waste, et cetera, et cetera. The focus generally has been, rather than the use phase of construction, the construction phase primarily because of the credit system uh, drives that process with the generation of environmental product declarations, et cetera. And when we look at the use phase, we also got to look at the energy efficiency and the service life of different structures and how does that impact the overall construction process. Uh, the focus on concrete naturally has been on cement and the impact that it uh, essentially uh, generates a lot of CO2 during its manufacture. But it has to be recognized that significant strides have been made by the cement industry to reduce, let's say, the clinko factor of cement as well as the energy efficiency of the manufacturing process. When we look at specifications, it's also important to strike a balance. We need to make sure that sustainability initiatives, such as forcing the use of a lower carbon footprint or forcing the use of recycled material, does not negatively impact the service life of a structure and its performance. We also need to look on the other side and make sure that specifications for concrete should not restrict in any way the concrete mixtures being supplied to the job from being more sustainable. Okay? And when we look at that, we're looking at primarily clinker factor because that drives, if you will, the carbon footprint of the concrete mixture. So we can look at it from two, two angles. We can look at it as how does sustainable construction get impacted by design. And so one would look at can we use higher strength concrete and therefore reduce the section side, reduce the dead load on a, on a building, and, and, and make our more efficient use. It might be a little more expensive on a unit volume basis, but we are probably minimizing uh, the amount of material used in a structure by impacting the design. Some of this is driven by specifications where when you have a very low water cement ratio, for example, but a design is using a lower strength, you might take advantage of the actual higher strength that is actually achieved to optimize section size of structural members. Uh, ACI 318, recently published, has now recognized the use of high strength steel, and you can also affect the uh, uh, optimization of the amount of steel rebar used in a structure by probably using uh, higher grade steels uh, if the design can afford it. The general focus has been on the concrete mixture, and this is an example of uh, the NRMCA's uh, industry-wide environmental product declaration, and I've just highlighted the section or the column that is related to the global warming potential, which is listed as the carbon dioxide, uh, kilos of carbon dioxide per cubic meter of concrete. And as you can see, you have a wide range uh, from the minimum to maximum, and you can see that as you increase the amount of supplementary cementing materials identified as FA for fly ash and SL for slag, you can see that the global warming potential in terms of that metric uh, decreases. Okay, And this is all regional, so you cannot use a table that was used in Texas for something in Boston because we have a whole set of regional parameters uh, for standard industry averages in, in Massachusetts or that region. There is also the evolution of uh, the uh, carbon calculator, if you will, uh, the primary one here through an industry collaboration through the Carbon Le Leadership Forum is working on a tool called the EC3, or Emb Embodied Carbon and Concrete Construction Calculator. And uh, this eventually will have actionable information about the embodied carbon in construction, and it would be based on geography and it could compare different materials. But if you look at the potential over here, you can see that uh, they are suggesting that at one point when, we, when you have three different mixtures in a submittal, you can possibly use the calculator to com compare uh, which one has the lowest uh, impact of carbon footprint or embodied carbon. So that is in development. It's something that concrete producers are not totally focused on at this point, but uh, as we evolve, that probably will be um, there. Uh, the next uh, point I want to make is concrete producers are incentivized to reduce their cost 
and as I show over here, the biggest portion of a concrete mixture, even though it's the smallest volume of the materials, is the cementitious system. So we can quantify that about 55% of a cost of a cubic yard of concrete is attributed to the cement, uh, cementitious system. Aggregates is about 40%, and the rest of it is relatively minimal cost. So why do concrete producers use more cement than they need to? Well, we can give you some reasons. Sometimes it's a surrogate for quality control procedures, or if you want to have a higher strength, just add 50 pounds of cement per yard, and you can get a higher strength. So there's not much effort, maybe, to progress to innovation. They want to reduce their risk, uh, and uh, the risk is associated with uh, failing acceptance criteria during a project. Primarily, the focus there is on strength. But they have to manage production variability that includes materials, uh, that includes the production process, and then a big other factor that they don't have much control over is the variability associated with the testing or acceptance testing of concrete at the job. But when we talk to producers, the main challenge that they see for progressing towards minimizing their cement contents are specifications because specifications just generally have minimum cement content requirements, maximum water cement ratio, generally when they are not required, uh, and those force you to just push up your cement factors in concrete mixtures. So these are some of the reasons why we actually see higher cement contents. Now we look at the big picture, there are various things that have to go into the design process, the loading, the environment, uh, the materials that are locally available, the, the mixture proportions that are come up with, and then the process of construction. Eventually, we'll want to get a crack fee cranky. Good luck with that. Uh, we want to have a pro prolonged service life of the structure. All that's part of the design, uh, the concrete that comes together, and the workmanship that puts the building together. Eventually, we want to look at the environmental impact of that process and hopefully look at the whole life LCA of that process. We uh, come up with what the owner needs. We are several, the owner has several requirements, the architect and engineer design the structure, and they establish project contract documents. These specifications can be either prescriptive, as seen in this example, where you have limits on cements, you have uh, additional clauses on the type of fly ash, for example, that can be used, and a maximum limit on fly ash that can be used. Or it could evolve to a performance-based type specification where performance properties are specified and the concrete producer now has the freedom to optimize the mixture for uh, their particular uh, specification. When you uh, look further uh, at the definition of performance versus prescription, uh, this is a very good and concise ASCE document. They define prescriptive specification as a process or a recipe for completing a project. Uh, the end result is intended but not precisely defined because it's prescribed as to how the intent is to be done. And the last bullet point here, I would claim is a fallacy because it says that the contractor can, cannot be faulted, but the contractor and the concrete producer is always faulted when there is a problem on a particular uh, uh, project. In that, uh, in that publication, they define a performance specification. Describes what the end result is or should be and not how it should be achieved. And the difficulty here is it must be clearly defined. At this point, you have the freedom for the contractor to come up with means and methods and concrete mixtures uh, that will um, achieve the end result. Most specifications are generally hybrid, a combination of prescriptive and performance, and this tends to cause more problems because you always generally have contradictions between the requirements in, in this type of hybrid situation. Uh, when we get down to the concrete mix, uh, our uh, NRMCA did come up with a definition. We basically say for the concrete mixture, we feel that the performance type specification is by performance indicators that are measured and verified by standard test methods, and there are no restrictions on the composition of the concrete mixture. We feel that there is expertise in different areas, and the concrete producer has the expertise in developing the mixtures that they are basically familiar with the materials that they have to deal with. 
And eventually, performance sustainability is impacted by a combination of design, specification, construction, and materials. This is an example where it's not an uncommon example for an interior building column. Again, we don't have any environmental exposure. It's an interior column, but we will see a specification that has a maximum water cement ratio, that has cement content specified, maximum limits on the fly ash, and then the specified strength used to design the member. We also have things like the slump uh, limits that make it difficult then for constructability. So when you have a specification like this, you might have two different producers that come up with two different bids or two different types of mixtures. And as you can see, one on the left has a higher paste volume, more cement, more water. He started off with the water content and established his cement content based on the water cement ratio. The second producer said, I'll optimize and reduce my water, let's say, by using an add mixture, and I've got a lower paste volume. Now, if this specification evolved to a performance specification, you might come up with a third scenario that was much more optimized. Now, you can see that the paste volume has considerably changed, and one can expect that the mixtures on the left would may have, maybe have a higher strength, which is not always good, but maybe you could take advantage of that higher strength in the design of the structure. Now, this is an interior column, so permeability and durability is probably not important, but shrinkage, creep, and other aspects, as well as temperature rise for mass concrete type situations, are important to keep the cracking to a minimum. So the opportunities are there to evolve something to a higher level. We uh, did an evaluation of the current state of specifications. We did an NRMCA survey, and we asked our members would we feel are more onerous prescriptive requirements, and then we asked them to send us project specifications, and we reviewed about 100 specifications and came up with a sort of criteria. We will have a listing, and I'm not going to go through this, but these are the things that our members felt were most onerous in terms of them getting to optimize their concrete mixtures. We quantified this as to the frequency that we saw these types of top five uh, prescriptive requirements in the specifications, and we compared them to what the industry standards actually uh, address it. And basically, if you follow industry standards such as ACI uh, documents, uh, you will not really have all these prescriptive requirements unnecessarily in the specifications that we use today. We published this as an article. If you're interested in reading that, more detail is in ACI Concrete International. And along with that, we develop what are called the specification in practice uh, sheets. These are one-pagers uh, for five topics. So you can read in summary uh, as to why someone should avoid these types of specification clauses. More recent, a article in Structure Magazine. If you're interested, you can get a copy of that and review that uh, as to um, how what uh, you know things that should be fixed in specifications. So real briefly, I'm going to go through some of the drawbacks of prescription and the advantages of moving to performance. One of the things that we want to say is prescription does not assure you that you will get performance. Minimum cement contents are historically used to say that we use it for Im improved durability, but that's not true. Maybe other reasons for that, but the only thing that you're assured with a minimum cement content is maybe that you got a minimum cement content in the concrete mixture. It doesn't help with any performance attribute. Maximum limits on SCMs, we see this as a misuse on um, uh, in specifications. There is one situation where you have to put a maximum limit as per the building code, and it's misused to, to be applied to all concrete. Maybe it's an attempt to control setting time or the rate of strength gain, but there are there is technology to overcome higher use of SCMs to achieve these goals. Uh, specifying combined aggregate grading to control shrinkage and curling on, on, on floor slabs, or maximum water cement ratios uh, when generally not necessary. We feel that prescription results in unoptimized mixtures that negatively impact performance. We have seen that when we have a higher cement content uh, and higher paste volume, you always get a negative impact on performance, as I illustrated in a previous example. If everybody was supposed to supply concrete with a 700 pound per cubic yard cement content, there is really no incentive for anybody to invest in quality control. Uh, what you see here is maybe from an engineer's standpoint an ideal specification because there are 
no low strength situations, but look at the variability of this concrete. It's got a coefficient of variation of 18%, very, very poor as per ACI 214. So just by uh, specifying a minimum cement content and achieving your strength, which is maybe set at a low level, you may not get the best quality in, in the project. It would live at some SEMs. Uh, we do see that it impacts sustainability. At some point, we quantified the uh, average quantity of SEMs in a cubic yard of concrete, not in a specific mix, but based on the annual uh, consumption of materials. Uh, and the primary question asked of producers is, why don't you use more? And the answer was, we don't use more because we are prohibited by the specification. So when we uh, we also have a sort of a just qualitative sort of assessment of how all these things impact, and we have a listing, and this is just five, but this uh, is published in the reference below where we went to about 25 items and looked at kind of specification of prescriptive requirements, the impact on sustainability, the impact on performance, and the impact on cost. So if you're interested, you can look at that uh, thing. Well, we also feel that the with prescriptive specifications, the assignment of responsibility is unclear. There's no authority with prescription, and therefore you cannot be responsible for what you don't have authority to do. And this is, can the concrete producer be responsible for concrete for the performance of the concrete mixtures, or can the contractor be responsible for the end result when the means and methods are prescribed? And when you have hybrid, this gets a lot more complicated. I refer you to the ACI 132 document, which has a guide for responsibility in concrete construction. So when you turn those disadvantages around, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, the advantages of moving to performance are clear. Better assurance of performance, prolonged service life, uh, mixtures are better optimized, quality is incentivized because now you have a, a competent producer and contractor involved, supports innovation, better assignment of responsibility, and in general, elevates the competency of the stakeholders. Performance-based specifications, you look at design uh, process, exposure, serviceability, service life, needs of the owner. Define the performance requirements on the basis of that design. Address the contractor's requirement. These are generally not in the, uh, in the specification, but part of the contractor's order producer develops a mix. At this point, a submittal is given to the engineer, at which point you have an opportunity for a discussion. Uh, you have the pre-qualification tests. Uh, you have field acceptance tests, hopefully simplified for a typical technician to perform in field situations. Uh, a, a system where you have consequences and a resolution if you do not meet the acceptance criteria. In general, you need qualified producers and contractors who partner well. Contractors' requirements are different from the designer's requirements. They want to have concrete that is predictable in terms of constructability requirements and moving their formwork and finishing slabs, et cetera. These are the types of things that they look for. There are various standards that are there for various of these things. Some of them are identified as pre-qualification. Some of them are probably tests that are used as acceptance at the job site. There are performance standards for strength, compressive, flexural, tensile, etc. Uh, these are could be pre-qualification or acceptance basis. Other considerations that can make concrete mixtures more sustainable is to consider a later age strength for high SCM type mixtures, with the consideration that you may need still need an early age requirement uh, if you're post-tensioning something or for formwork removal needs of the contractor. You could use maturity for estimating in place strength. Field cured cylinders do not give a good assessment of that. For pavements, you generally see flexural strength to validate the design. Then you have standards for dimensional change, modulus or creep, shrinkage, etc. In general, what you'll see for shrinkage requirements are you would uh, generally specify, even though not a very ideal test, a uh, length change type measurement, uh, evaluating the dimensional change of concrete in a uh, beam type situation, uh, typical uh, process of testing that and typical criteria used. 
Uh, what is seen is on the left, uh, as the pace volume increases, uh, primarily driven by water, but also by cementitious, you will see that the shrinkage of a mix increases. On the right, you'll see a ring shrinkage test. Not very easy to do, but it's predicting when that concrete will crack, uh, and, and that's also evolving. Durable concrete, what do we need? Uh, we need to use quality materials. We need to reduce the permeability of concrete. We recognize this thing, and then we need to make sure that the concrete has the reduced potential for cracking. Um, we have to look at the quality of the paste, and naturally that includes the use of SCMs and fly ash and slag and silica fume all improve the quality of the paste in its terms of its microstructure and transport properties, and admixtures can help this situation also. We want to minimize the quantity of paste. Again, minimum cement contents drive up the quantity of paste. And we also need to have improved quality control at a ready-mix concrete producer and during the construction process. And then address other requirements for specific durability issues such as ASR or alkali aggregate reaction or sulfate resistance, etc. The ACI 318 since 2008 has published durability requirements in terms of defined exposure classes that expose to buildings. We still do not see the exposure class concept used in specifications, or if used, it's not used correctly. Even master spec only included durability exposure classes in the December 2018 version of master spec. So it's been a long time before we've actually seen this. The concepts can also be applied to other structures, such as transportation structures primarily relies on water cement ratio to reduce the permeability of concrete, does not recognize the benefits provided by SCMs in that process. And then project specifications have to address other factors. This is the general exposure categories and classes in ACI. The design professional has to pick for each of these exposure categories one or more of these classes for each type of member in a building. So when you come up with the design, you have the assignment of exposure classes that then drives the requirements of concrete that would be based on the load or durability requirements that drives the strength and whether or not a water cement ratio is required for those members. At this point, I am going to transfer the screen. And Andrew, if you help me with this, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and transfer it to Karthik. Okay. Great, we, we, we can see it, Kartik, go right ahead, but you're uh, muted, that's all. Okay, you're able Great. to see my screen, right? Okay. Yep, yep, we got all it, right. go right ahead. Uh, all right, so Colin mentioned in uh, ACI 318, uh, the water cement ratio is, is the main uh, criteria, actually the only criteria to select mixtures for low uh, permeability. Uh, but as you can see from this plot here, that uh, for there, there's a there is a yeah there is a weak correlation between water cement ratio and permeability, but you could have quite a wide variation of permeability at the same water cement ratio. Uh, one of the main reasons why is because the SCMs, the supplementary cementing materials, have a big impact, and uh, that's not captured in just this water cement ratio factor that is here, and that's uh, something 318 doesn't do as well. So uh, the other thing uh, I wanted to show here in this slide is that uh, you can see um, uh, this work done at NRMCA, and uh, you can what we did here is that um, uh, we took at a specific water cement ratio. Let's take 0.47 here, and we made a concrete with different cementitious contents, higher cementitious contents. So as, as you go towards the right, the cementitious contents are going up, the water content is also going up because we're trying to maintain the 0.47 water cement ratio. So as you can see, as long as we kept the water cement ratio same, the strength more or less stayed the same. And this was happening with 0.47, 0.40, and 0.55 water cement ratio. 
0.4 and 0.55 water cement ratio. And I guess the point is that um, using a higher cement factor really doesn't help. It's a water cement ratio that is controlling the strength and uh, just requiring a higher minimum cement content in the specification is really not helping the strength. And in fact, it may be counterproductive because uh, if you look here, um, he could, uh, if the same water cement ratio, having a higher cementitious content actually increases your coulombs because you have a higher paste volume, as Colin mentioned, more porosity, more permeability as well. Now, um, I'm not going to go into all these details. So we said water cement ratio is not a good way to choose mixes with low permeability. But there are lots of alternatives, better alternatives, test methods than water cement ratio to choose mixtures for um, low permeability concrete. And uh, there's a whole bunch of this uh, water permeability test. Uh, there are this chloride diffusion test. These are all very research oriented. Out of all these tests, the ones in the red, on my screen at least, are the ones that are more practical and very more commonly used. The one that you see here at the top is the ASTMC 1202 test, the RCPT, Rapid Chloride Permeability Test, or the Coulomb test that some may be familiar with. Uh, essentially, it puts a slice of concrete, it uh, measures the amount of charge that passes through that concrete, and uh, the higher the charge pass, the higher the permeability, so you want a low permeability concrete meaning low charge pass. So it's basically a measure of conductivity of concrete. Now there is an inverse of conductivity as you very well know from elementary physics is the resistivity. So there have been some new tests being developed on bulk resistivity tests where uh, we want a high resistivity of the concrete. These are actual tests and ASTM is in the process of developing test methods as well. So uh, uh, this is something that the ACR 318 is considering, for example, for exposure C2, instead of the water cement ratio and uh, strength, they're thinking about using something like a 1202 limit, their RCP limit of 1500 coulombs. Now, uh, this would be a pre-qualification test, meaning that the producer would supply, when he does a mix a middle uh, at the job, he would supply uh, test data showing that the uh, mix uh, satisfies this uh, Coulomb requirement. Uh, and actual verification the job site could be based on strength. Now, if you do want to use this test method for acceptance criteria, meaning you are making specimens at the job site and using uh, measuring or CPT and using that for qualific mix, uh, mix um, acceptance, then you want to consider the variability of these test methods. All these durability test methods tend to be a little bit more variable, as you can see here. This is from a project uh, back in 2003, uh, where the strength is shown in blue and the red is the uh, RCPT. And you can see the, the uh, strength, the coefficient of variation is a measure of variation, is about 8.5%, whereas the RCPT is about 30%. So that's about four times higher variation. Now I've seen later data from Virginia DOT and the Port Authority of New Jersey, which you, both of these uh, entities use these tests a lot, with, and they have a lot of good experience in how to do this RCPT test. Uh, but I still see a variation about two to three times higher variation compared to the compressive strength test, at least twice. So, so that's something that you want to keep in mind if you're going to use this test method for acceptance criteria. Now the newer test that I mentioned before in the previous slide about resistivity test promises to be less variable and maybe there is potential. I can see here this is the resistivity test being conducted. At the top you're seeing the surface resistivity test. Uh, this, As you can see this geometry, you can actually test structures uh, in place. So you can have a column that is in the, in, in the, in the, in the bridge deck, for, or the bridge deck, for example, and you can test it and measure the resistivity. So that's a very powerful uh, tool. Now, this is a more of a specimen. You make a four by eight cylinder. Just before measuring strength, you uh, put these um, uh, end caps, and then you run the current and measure the resistivity of the concrete. Uh, so obviously, this is less expensive to do, quicker to do, condition is better. Uh, uh, data shows that these tend to be more precise. There are some issues. Of course, you've got to put the geometry correction factor. Saturation tends to be a big 
deal because if you can think about it, if the concrete is allowed to dry out, then it will be a lot harder for the current to pass. You know, dry concrete is not a very good conductor compared to wet concrete. So you would measure very high resistivity even though it's a concrete has not changed. It just become drier, right? So you, you want to make sure and pay attention to this conditioning. So we have a research project ongoing at the NRMC lab looking precisely at this issue. Uh, of course, for free soil resistance, many are familiar with the air content test, but there's also this ASTMC 666 test where you make prisms, uh, you are, have about 300 freezing and thawing cycles, uh, about five or seven cycles a day, um, and then at the end of the 300 cycles, you measure uh, what is called the durability factor, you, you, and you want to get a number that is over 60, uh, at least over 60 percent, preferably more than 80 percent. Uh, you're measuring the dynamic model of elasticity of these prisms. Uh, now there's this other technique which is called the, uh, for the scaling, uh, which is the ASTM C672, where you have these prisms and you put calcium chloride solutions on top of it, and then you again uh, have cycles, these are daily cycles, freezing and thawing cycles. At the end of 50 cycles, you look at the conditioning of the samples, and based on how bad it looks like, you give a visual rating. Okay, and um, um, and from that you can actually use this test method. Actually, this test method has been used for specification purposes. For example, we know the Ontario DOT uses it, and uh, there are Washington DOT has has also used it. Of course, this is a hardened air water analysis petrographic method, where you're looking at the spacing factor, bubble size uh, spacing factor, uh, which again has more reliability compared to a straight air content test. Uh, Alkali aggregate reaction is another durability issue. There is an ASTMC 1778. It's a guide which tells you how to mitigate against that. The first thing they say is you establish the reactivity level of the aggregate, how reactive the aggregate is. And uh, then based on that, they suggest a prescriptive approach, uh, which uh, involves uh, using different levels of uh, supplementary cementing materials or using alkali loadings of cement contents, uh, low alkali cements, and so on. And and a combination of these for very severe situations. There's a performance approach as well, which relies on either the, uh, it's a two-year concrete prism test, C1293, which may be impractical for some projects, uh, but the more common that we use a lot, we see a lot in specs is a 16-day motor bar test is the ASTM C1567. Now all of this for alkali silica reaction, for alkali carbonate reaction, they just say aggregate susceptible to ACR cannot be used. Uh, and, and the new ACI 318, which will be out this year, will say that this, the designer, needs to consider ASR while designing the structure. Now, ACI 301 offers a more practical way of dealing with this. They basically say, uh, do not use aggregates susceptible to ACR. Okay, so that's one thing. And then they say, uh, run the ASTMT C1293 test, and if the expansion suggests that the aggregate is reactive, you have two options. Either use the ASTM C1567 to figure out how much supplementary cementing materials you get, that you got to use, that's the performance approach, or you can use um, uh, different levels of concrete alkali content depending on the aggregate expansion levels. High expansions means high reactivity, so you have a low concrete alkali content. Okay, so all of this is good. So we have heard about all this. Uh, we hear this a lot from engineers and they say, um, but how do we really evolve to a performance spec? All this is good in theory. So what can I do? So what we suggest is first is look at your spec and see can you eliminate or at least minimize prescription, particularly key things that we talked about a lot, minimum cement factors, SCM limits like fly ash limits, uh, restrictions on aggregate, on grading, and things like that. Try to eliminate or minimize it. Then look at the uh, exposure conditions for ACI 318. Um, look at that and make sure you just specify the, uh, the necessary requirements, okay, uh, for free star, chloride, sulfate, and so on. And do not specify water cement ratio when you don't really need it. Just because uh, you know, low water cement ratio concrete is not always good concrete. The concrete that is fit for the purpose is what we need. And just because concrete low water cement ratio is low, that doesn't mean that it's great and you should always specify that. 
So you really need to uh, balance it based on the exposure condition. Now, uh, then you look at the different member types and come up with these exposure criteria and based on that, come up with performance criteria. Uh, and this is how it would look like. Uh, for example, you have the different member types listed on this column here. Uh, then you have the ACI 318 exposure classes that you can um, uh, develop. And then you have your specified strength based on design as well as the, based on the durability requirements. If, if there are water cement ratio requirements from the from these exposure classes, then things like aggregate size, air content, slump, chloride limits, and temperature limits. All of these are ACI 318 requirements. Now in addition to that, for as depending on the structural member, you may have performance requirements on top of that. For example, the lapid chloride permeability test for chloride penetrability, for generally for low permeability concrete, shrinkage test, freezing and thawing, ASR, modulus of elasticity. So there's a lot of these things that can be added. Remember, the key thing is that you don't want to fill all of this because the more you fill, it's going to be, it can lead to more uh, expensive mixtures in general, and that could be contradictory as well uh, in terms of uh, you want one, in one case you want this, you want other key performance. So you want to be very careful about really does my member require that performance. And here are some suggestions. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details. For example, I'll just point out that for exposure class W1C2, where you want low permeability concrete, water cement ratio is suggested by 318, and we're suggesting something like cool ohms, right? And uh, for example, for F3, where salt scaling is an issue, 318 suggests the supplementary cementing materials. Uh, I guess another option would be uh, to use ASTMC 672 uh, visual rating test uh, uh, that we just uh, just showed that Ontario DOT is, for example, looking at. Okay, so all of this is good, but there's still theory. I've got practical applications. How do I use it? So that's the question. And uh, for example, I'm looking at here is a bridge deck in New York. It's a practical example. Let's see how we do it. Um, ACI 318 would say the exposure class is a severe freeze thaw, so it's F3. You can have scaling, you'll have freezing and thawing. There is no sulfate, so it's S0. There is moisture, it can rain W1, C2. That could be a risk of corrosion because they put a lot of salt in New York City. Um, okay, so these are the criteria, and uh, let's see what the prescription, typical prescription says. The, the ACR 318 would say 0.4 water cement ratio, 5,000 PSI, air and frame concrete. The engineer may choose to add a few more, maybe like a fly ash limit and so on, but that's about it. Now, a performance criteria would look like is an RCPT value of 1,500 coulombs at 28-day accelerated moist curing based on C1202. Now, that will ensure low permeability concrete. Uh, maximum shrinkage limit, 0.05% at seven days of curing and 28 days of drying. Now, why is this? Because shrinkage means, uh, a shrinkage limit ensures that there is less cracking and, and there's less cracking means less permeability of concrete for, for chlorides to come in and any other ions to come in. Uh, air entrainment, of course, for free thaw durability. Uh, and of course, strength generally you see 4,000 PSI or higher. You want to use as large a coarse aggregate size that will allow you, but depending on your rebar spacing and the specimen dimensions, uh, so that your water demand can be uh, low. And uh, ASR consideration should be considered as well. Second example, a case study would be an interior floor slab. It could be anywhere in the US. So again, uh, there is no exposure problem. There is no freezing, no sulfate, no water or chlorides. Uh, typical prescription. Now this is, this is interesting because we see these interflow slabs used a lot, for example, in big box retailers like Walmarts and so on, Albertsons and so on. And these are some of the most prescriptive uh, mixes. We see everything listed, water content, cement content, egg grading, SCM limits, they're very concerned in terms of um, uh, the, uh, the super flat finish, no cracking, no curling, and so on, but the approach is a very prescriptive approach. So what does a performance approach look like? Again, you want to look at a low shrinkage. Why? Because cracking and curling is a concern for this particular application. Setting time is a concern, maybe not for the engineer as such, but for the contractor, they want consistent setting times so that they can progress with the work. 
Now, workability, finishability, bleeding. Now, the workability, finishability, there's not really good tests that can tell you how the slab will finish or work with. Uh, really, you want to have a test slab placement uh, to figure these things out. And strength, we generally see 3,500 PSI or higher. You want to use a large coarse aggregate size. This is very standard for water demand considerations. Uh, case three, uh, it will be a British foundation in Colorado. Again, uh, you have a no freeze thaw because it's a foundation. It's under the uh, under the ground. There is no freezing. Uh, it's a very we assume that it's a very severe sulfate environment. So an S3 criteria, it can be moisture because it's under the ground. There's no chloride C not. So the prescription would say according to 318.45 water cement ratio, 4500 psi, and a sulfate resistant cementitious. Uh, performance, again, low permeability concrete, RCP, shrinkage requirement. Again, why? Because sulfate is another ion that comes from outside in the soil into the concrete. So you want low permeability for not initially for chlorides for the case 31, but in this case for sulfates, right? So you want to again have no cracking or less cracking. That will be for shrinkage. Uh, again, this is uh, specifically on the cementitious aspect. It's an ASTMC 1012 test, which 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 tells you, which helps you select cementitious, um, um, I guess types and types that will be more sulfate resistant. Okay, so you are looking at a less than 0.1 percent at 18 months for high, very uh, high sulfate resistance, like an S3, and this has been um, this is actually in the building code this requirement. And then you got strength requirements, aggregate size, and since it's a foundation, thermal control plan is something that needs to be considered. You want to have a low max internal temperature and a temperature differential requirements as well. Okay, so all of this is good, and for performance specs particularly to be um, to be valid, it's very important that the stakeholders are qualified, meaning that the contractor uh, has a, a certain certifications, uh, the uh, the um, uh, master spec has requirements which are which are quite which can be quite uh, uh, valid and used. For example, they will say that the contractor may needs to have a slab uh, finishes um, uh, certification ACI, uh, concrete supplier needs to be be able to uh, conform to C94. It could be a, a NRMC spec or an RMC certification or a DOT certification. Testing agencies need to meet 1077, for example. That's a testing uh, lab accreditation. Uh, they need to uh, have um, uh, techniques where they actually take care of cylinders of the job site. This is a very important issue because now you're dealing with performance specs. There's a lot of testing at the job site. You want to make sure that the cylinders are taken care of well. So that's an important thing to consider too. Uh, Pre-construction conference is again very important because it's going to be a, a lot of, uh, this is in general a good thing for all projects uh, and for performance projects as well, where you discuss all these details, job mix adjustments, initial curing, responsibility to accept reject concrete, and so on. Uh, okay, so one of the main things why this uh, webinar was prompted initially was that how do we go about minimizing cement, right? Can performance specs help you minimize cement? So that was one of the main things that were um, uh, that was initially asked, and uh, we believe yes. So if your goal is to minimize cement, first evaluate if if your specification is causing high cement content, right? So you want to look at your spec and say, do I have a high minimum cement factors? Then probably you're working against it. You're working against your goal. Uh, or do I have a max water cement ratio when I don't really need it? Well, uh, if you're having a 0.4 when you don't need a exposure class, that's no good. Uh, do I have limits on SCMs? Uh, except, of course, uh, exposure F3, where your scaling is an issue. Uh, then, yeah, then your 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 goal of minimizing cement is, uh, goes out of the out of the window. Uh, of course, specifying later age strength like 56 or 90 day strength can incentivize a lower cement content as well. Uh, the other things, this this are good, okay, so this is kind of minimizing prescription. So that is the objective of the first bullet. Now, uh, it's important to consider the expertise of the contractor, producer, and lab. This is an important issue. Why? Because let's say the lab is not qualified. In other words, the testing is very poor quality. There is no uh, 
treatment of the specimens at the job site, then the producer and the contractor are forced to design mixes at a much higher strength to avoid low break problems. So that would actually increase your cement factors. Okay, so that's so the, so really all these play a role. So the same thing works with producer and contractor too. If the quality level is very low, uh, if the variability is high, then they're forced to increase their uh, cement content to get higher, much higher strengths to meet the specified requirements. So uh, that's an important thing to consider. Uh, so you want to uh, look at in the local area producers who have who pay a lot of attention, understanding the materials controlling variability, optimizing their mixtures to, uh, uh, to get to low minimum cement factors. Now, if you do uh, have the project out and you do see in the submittal very high cement factors, then it, it calls, you can have a discussion and uh, the AE can uh, say that is one of the main objectives to reduce cement factors. Now, long-term objective would be to look at something like Collins showed at the industry average GWP, uh, global warming potential, and try to lower that. Uh, it tends to be a little bit more complex, and of course, the key issue is that you want to balance those requirements with the project goals as well, in performance goals mainly. Uh, generally, we suggest that uh, prescriptive limits to control high cement contents uh, to be avoided because that can be counterproductive. Uh, so if you do all that, uh, there is innovation possible. This is an example. In 1996, they built this bridge uh, to Prince Edward Island for 100 years service life, very demanding service life, uh, environment here. Uh, the I-35W bridge, the many will be familiar, was um, uh, there's a tragedy back in 2008, and then they rebuilt this uh, in 2009 in, Min in Minneapolis. And uh, this is a pretty amazing um, uh, mixed proportions used here. You can see the super structure had 29% SCM, uh, 6500 PSI with a spec requirement. The peers, uh, let me point this out to you, the peers had 85% SCM and they had only 85 pounds of cement per cubic yard of concrete. Uh, and uh, the specification requirement is 4000 PSI and 0.45 water cement ratio. So you could get pretty amazing mixtures with very low cement contents. Clearly, prescriptive mix specifications will not work to get you this type of performance to this type of mixture proportions. There's no way you can have a prescriptive mix to that. Footings and shrill shafts, again, have very low cement factors and 60% SEM in the concretes. And uh, the performance uh, was very good just because you're having such uh, low cement factors and high SEM did not mean the performance suffered. The superstructure had over 8,000 PSI. The Coulomb levels were very low for all the elements. So that seems good, low permeability concrete, low shrinkage in general uh, for all the elements. I guess, again, the key point again is that look at what they did. For peers, they did not put a lot of performance requirements. They were concerned with their thermal control issue for cracking. Uh, they did not put too many strength, early age strength requirements. That allowed them to put as low as 85 pounds of cement in the mixture. And, uh, again, uh, closer to New York City here, uh, this, uh, this structure was built uh, uh, a couple years back finished, and here they, they achieved 16,000 PSI concrete and 7.5 million PSI modulus, and they used only 300 pounds of cement in the mixture, 66% SCM, and this is an SCC mixture, 25-inch slump flow. Again, a performance project. Uh, this is an uh, article uh, that was published last year in the CI. There's a lot of case studies of performance projects. You can read up on that. And uh, one, just one example was that the uh, Missouri DOT, uh, this is a project again uh, for the Christopher Bond Bridge that is listed in this article here. Uh, they documented that using a performance approach, they were able to reduce their cementitious uh, compared to their typical DOT spec uh, quite a bit. Uh, anywhere from 50 to 100 pounds per cubic yard. So uh, this is a performance engineered mixtures program. It's a, it's a running uh, that's in the uh, National Concrete Paving Technology Center. They are developing the ASH to PP84. It's a kind of a parallel development that's ongoing. Just want to mention that. And we have a lot of other resources as well that you can look at. You can access our website here. You can get the guide to improving spec. 
the SIP that Colin talked about. ACI has come up with a couple of documents as well that is worth reading. So that's all I had. I think uh, uh, you can have a look at our contacts, and uh, if you have any questions, you can feel free to do that. Great. Thanks so much, Colin and Kartik. We do have a couple questions that I want to try and get to here in the last few minutes before the hour. Um, probably the, the, the we got a couple questions that were basically about does a performance-based approach affect both the cost and the timing of a project, right? Like it seems you're talking about additional tests that have to be done. The implication is that maybe that would increase timing and or cost. So could, could you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, I think it depends on the performance requirements, right? For example, we are seeing a lot of projects, uh, and we do a lot of testing at our lab as well, uh, with ASO requirements. And uh, there they're looking at a 1567 uh, data, and that's got a 14-day uh, test requirement. Now, we do see projects with shrinkage requirements, and that takes, uh, you know, if you include the curing time, that's about 35 days. So, yeah, so a little bit more lead time. Um, the uh, RCPT or resistivity, again, you're looking at a 28-day lead time uh, for those kinds of test methods. So, yes, it, you, if you want to do it tomorrow, then you've got a problem, yes. But if you have a little bit of lead time, maybe a couple of months, you can fit in a lot of these test methods. These are not one-year, two-year, three-year uh, test methods. The only thing that is uh, may, may be a question would be the 1012 test that I mentioned, the ASTMC 1012 for sulfate resistance. That does take a much longer, it's a year-long test. I think the new ACI would have a one-year requirement. And, and just another comment regarding the cost. I mean, until until there is a uh, until there is a uh, better use of test methods and proficiency of these test methods, it might cost initially. But if it gets to be standard practice, it possibly can reduce the cost. Naturally, you got to find proficient labs that can do uh, some of these tests. In terms of mixed costs, uh, prefer not to comment on that. You can see that the cement content could decrease, but that's uh, the prerogative of the producer as to how they want to price their concrete. Yeah, I think it also speaks to the point that you made about the importance of having the collaboration among the entire team early on, right? And as you said, so if you have that, if you have people on board early on, you can maybe account for that additional testing time and incorporate that into the schedule. Right, and, and if you see FAA jobs, and these are primary airfield pavements, the process of evaluation of materials needs a lead time of 18 months, where you start with the aggregates evaluation and stuff like that. So it can be considerable, but we don't anticipate a significant lead time when test methods become standard practice for building pipe structures and, and yeah. what the owner is, can afford in, in terms of cost. But in terms of the, the overall cost, it seems like, you know, does the, um, th there is, like, so another question is about how the performance spec places greater responsibility of the QC function. So is that cost allocated to the in-place production of the concrete? I realize that the owner pays for it all in the end, but just kind of who specifically, where the bill is charged, I guess, maybe the, the well, I think if, I think it's the same process of how we sell drugs. If, if, if someone has spent a lot of money and time on developing a, you know, high quality or highly performance mix, then they have the prerogative to charge accordingly. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, another question is, you know, does the performance spec mean the producer will change the mix design on the fly as their material properties change during the project? Um, well, I'll comment on that. In ACI 301, we've tried to address that. And, you know, you have a submittal that says this is the, these are the proposed mixtures on a project. Some engineers are very adamant that they, you should not deviate from the proposed mixes. But I think that they have to be some leeway and within some sort of a small range that someone is allowed to make adjustments during the production day in real time uh, to adjust for variations of uh, materials and project conditions. Uh, but it, it, it can't be like that I'm going to switch out a cement or I'm going to switch from a fly ash to a slag or something like that. It has to be within reason of the proposed mixes. Sure. Yes, I think that's exactly what has been done. For example, I mentioned Port Authority of New Jersey, Virginia, DOT, Florida. All of these have a lot of 
a little more experience in performance projects. That's exactly what they did. They have a lot of variation of this, uh, for example, cement content, water content, so that uh, those uh, numbers can be met. And also another comment is, is if uh, if some of the, if these projects are common, the producers can develop the data beforehand, and uh, it will be just like strength. For example, if you ask a producer, can you give me 4,000 PSI, they already have a mixture which can meet that. Now, if, uh, if the same thing could work for coulombs, it could look for other things, ASR, and so on. Producers could have uh, data, mixtures developed for those performance requirements. Great. Um, a, a kind of a related question about this mixture evolving over time is that if you're interested in doing life cycle assessment or getting <clears throat> EPDs for a concrete um, based on this performance-based approach, um, if the mixture isn't known at the time that you're doing it, you know, can you still do the EPD? Um, and at least, you know, maybe I'll, I'll comment a, a little bit on this based on some of uh, our experience. EPDs are based on a specific mixture, um, and usually what companies do is they publish EPDs including a whole bunch of mixtures. But they are evolving to an approach where basically what they do is they work with um, someone who has a tool that can, that the, and the tool is approved to calculate uh, EPDs for any mixture. So I think um, that function is changing within companies where they can rapidly produce EPDs for any mixture um, because essentially the whole tool is approved to be able to create those. So I, I don't know if, if Colin or Kartik, if you uh, uh, agree with that, but I, I don't see that as being much of a barrier with this uh, going forward with the shift uh, towards use of tools. I don't. I think I see the family of uh, family of mixture type EPD concept evolving. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me just... Uh, <clears throat> Um, and I mean, like, like the the, the follow-up question to that is that can they can they do it, like like these mixtures come out? I, I guess how far in advance do they come uh, during the construction process? Um, e EPDs uh, those can be uh, uh, you know submitted for lead points even after the. Um, Construction is over, but as far as doing a life cycle assessment in advance, there is still this this chance that I guess you end up using a different mixture than what you expect in a life cycle assessment. We would uh, defer to our sustainability gurus on some of those. Sure, sure, sure. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think that basically, you, like that happens with any construction project, right? That where basically during the design process, you may specify one material that ends up being something different that's used in the uh, process. And what's used in the life cycle assessment process doesn't have to actually be um, the, 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 the final thing that's used on the job project. Uh, you act obviously want those to be aligned, but when you do that, that life cycle assessment, you don't actually have to use a specific uh, EPD. You just want to have something that you think is representative of what will actually be, be used, so. All right. Um, I think that uh, that's about all the time that we have. Colin and Kartik, thank you uh, very much for uh, taking the time to share your expertise on this. Um, and as people saw, it was, it was quite a bit. Um, as we mentioned, there will be uh, uh, this uh, recording will be posted to YouTube and um, we'll follow up with uh, all the attendees with a link to that uh, recording if you want to watch this again. If you want to get a copy of the slides, please just send an email to CSHub at mit.edu, and we'll be able to, to share those. And uh, please uh, stay connected with us, and we'll be able to have you join us for future uh, CS Hub webinars as well. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Jeremy and the uh, Mighty Hub for providing us the opportunity to give the talk. And uh, our uh, contact information is also listed. And if there are questions that uh, people have come up with uh, or come up later, you can also contact us and we can respond. Great. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye.